Okay, greetings everyone. Welcome in this new live uh, dedicated to Mongolia and its art and culture. I'm very glad to see you here again today. I hope you, you are doing well and that you had a great week. Um, for me, that was pretty good. I think I have a, an interesting news also for you at the end of this video, uh, especially related to the calligraphy and the Mongolian writing something that might be interesting uh, to you. So let's see how people are coming and then we can, uh, we can start. Um, I will start with the, the first uh, question from the Discord. Today we, we have like a four person on Discord that ask a few interesting questions. Hello, back to more. Hello, Loki, and hello, William. I hope you are doing great. Thanks for joining here. Uh, hello, Bjorn. So I will start uh, with some of the questions that were asked uh, on Discord. As I was saying, uh, hello, hello, Denise. Uh, as I was saying, some questions are very interesting. So that's really be that's gonna be a very interesting live. I hope. So the, the first question from uh, Matthews, he asked, I assume you are living in, a, in an authentic gear. If yes, how it is to live in a gear? Uh, can a foreigner rent a gear for a few months? How does it turn out financially compared to renting uh, a flat in the city? And do you always live in a gear or do you rent a flat? So, okay, sorry, my dog is a little bit crazy right now. <laughs> um, and how do neighbors react to your murderer practice? So I'm not actually living in an authentic gear. Uh, it's half a gear. I'm renting a flat in the city. Um, this half a gear is actually... Um, a gear that I, I collected other, over the month, years to make uh, a cultural center and have a, um, a gear kind of like a decoration in the center to show to people when I give lecture, conference and stuff like that to give uh, an idea, especially to the kids and the children that uh, now live in the city a lot and they don't really know how it looks inside a gear. They don't really understand the different uh, items, uh, the different symbolism that can be in the gear. So I actually kind of created half a gear uh, for the, the center, for the cultural center Oroz, that I created last year. And uh, now I live uh, in a flat in uh, Ulaanbaatar and I kind of transformed my living room uh, in, in a yurt, in half a yurt, almost like a two third of a, of a yurt, of a gear, to make, as you know, the, the, into the murder hall show and now to make the live because I want to show uh, kind of something that is a little bit authentic, respectful to the tradition. That's why also I, I wear a hat. Uh, usually that's a little bit rude to present oneself without a hat. So for that, that that's why uh, I have this half uh, gear inside my home to illustrate uh, the living of Mongolians in my flat and for the show and kind of like a little uh, video studio, I would say. Of course, I lived in gear a uh, few times in my six year uh, in Mongolia, especially when I was going to the West for research or for trip. So I lived in tests, in test some for like few months. Uh, so that was really in the middle of nowhere. The closest city was at eight hour of bus. So um, that, was, that was very cool. And uh, the closest neighbor was like uh, one or two kilometer. So no problem with Muro practice. In that case, uh, we can just play. And usually, you know, Mongolians, they really enjoy to listen to Muro. Even if it's super good or if it's super bad, doesn't really matter. Just having the sound of the instrument is usually quite pleasing uh, to Mongolians, especially in the countryside, in the city, that can be a little bit different. 
of course if i play uh, oh it's snowing and uh, uh, sorry <laughs> of course if, if i play uh, in the middle of the night in my flat uh, if it's like resonating everywhere just like in any city in any uh, apartment of course the neighbor might be a little bit like annoyed but during the day in the normal hour usually i never ha i never had any issues uh, here uh, i had in paris when i was uh, playing in my flat in paris but in mongolia i don't remember having someone like knocking at my door like hey man you're playing so bad or you're playing too loud or whatever i i, I in six years i think i never had this kind of experience so usually mongolians uh, they are very tolerant uh, with the, the noise in general uh, because when they live in a gear, you know, uh, they can be kids playing there, they can be another person maybe singing or cooking, then another person practicing pia little piano or murderer or something else, then people talking, and it's always very lively. So, on that aspect, I never had uh, that many issues actually i never had any issues i would say then another part uh, of the of the question was about renting a gear uh, renting a yurt uh, i'm not too familiar with renting a yurt uh, to live i know there is a ton of uh, tourist camp there is a ton of camps uh, in UB, in, in Ulaanbaatar, or in the countryside and everything. I'm not really sure about the price, but I think that it might start around maybe um, 20 euro per day or something like that. And it can go up until maybe one or 200 euro per day uh, for the very luxury camp. The thing is, you know, you can find a gear, a full, a full gear, uh, without all the all all the furniture inside, just the the kind of the skeleton, I would say, the wall, um, the esky, the roof, and and so on. I think you can find maybe for like two two thousand euro or three three thousand euro, you can find a gear. So that's definitely cheaper than a flat if you have the space to put a gear. Uh, so for that, there is no comparison uh, in terms of price. And for, for your information, my rent, the, the rent I pay for this flat now, it's almost, it's not really in the center of UB. It's a little bit, uh, hello, Laura, how are you? Um, so I'm not really in the center of UB. I'm a, maybe half an hour walk from, <coughs> from the center of UB. And my rent is like uh, 600,000. So it's like, uh, 200 euro, something like that per month, including uh, the water and electricity, the, the warmth and, and, and that. So around 200 euro per month. Um, so yeah, that's it for, but I'm, I'm quite lucky. I have a very supportive, uh, how to say, renting person. Uh, they really support what I do. So they kind of give me discount from time to time and they're very gentle on that. So, so that, but I, I think that average uh, rent price in, in the city might be around 350, 500 euro per month or something like that. So I, I hope that, uh, I would say, I hope that it answers the question about the renting, about the price, uh, about the fact that I'm not exactly living in a real gear. Uh, but I still sleep on the ground every night here inside the yurt. Uh, so it, it's very, it's very great actually to to be in the countryside, um, just in the you know in the yurt environment because the sound is different. There is less echo. Um, if you are in the countryside, if if we are like in the nature, then there will be the the, the sound of the wind, maybe the river if a river is close. Uh, the herd, like many cows and, and um, of course the sheep and, and goats and everything. So it, it's very, it's very peaceful. I mean, the sleeping there is, is super cool. It's super calm. Um, I, I really enjoy uh, the, the, the living in, in the gear or, or like that. Of course, there is always the problem of the toilet. Uh, because in the pure countryside, there is no toilet or anything. It's just like in the white. So in terms of intimacy, that can be a little bit uh, 
weird in the beginning. Then after a while, it gets it gets uh, we just get used to it. Um, so yeah, I think that that's kind of it. But this uh, flat your uh, difference. I would say that during the winter, though, uh, living in a flat is much more comfortable because uh, in the night in Mongolia, it can go up to minus 50 or eventually minus 60. So in winter, living in a yurt, we need to wake up maybe every two or three hours to put some uh, wood or arhal. So it's like the, the cold shit, if I could say. Sorry for the bad word. Um, in, in the fire to warm the gear again because after a few hours, if the, if the fire uh, stops, then it, it's really, really, really cold, even inside the yurt. So in the winter, that's a little bit, that can be a little bit exhausting to have to wake up every, anyway, the, the cold just gonna wake you up. So waking up every two or three hours to put the fire back and, and warm. So of course, living in a flat during the winter is definitely more comfortable. There is no, uh, no argument about that. So, um, so yeah, I think that's it for, for this uh, set of question. So I hope that Matthias uh, is there and that I answered uh, all this curiosity. So I can move on to the next question. This time, a uh, question from Bjorn. And I think that Bjorn is here with us. So I am that kid with a mic from Fruit Singing Discord. <laughs> ah, that's good. So um, next question is from Bjorn. Could you, so it, it's more uh, about the murder world this time. Could you explain a little bit about the wolf note, how to manage them? So that's the first part of the question. And are the Inner Mongolian Mareholt tuned the same as the Mongolians one? Okay, so I will start uh, with the wolf knot. Um, so the wolf knot, basically, it's like a sound that is something like that. If I take a comparison with the recently uh, um, movie that went out, uh, Ford versus Ferrari, you might have seen this movie, and in this movie, there, there is some kind of, I think that it's 7,000 or 8,000 uh, run per minute for the engine. And if it reach that limit, uh, everything can, kind of like goes in mess. It's kind of like a resonance frequency uh, for kind of like vibration, resonance frequency, something like that. So the wolf knot kind of work the same. It's like actually a mistake that was made in the, in the making of the instrument, usually on the front and back part of uh, the, the, the box. So it's like the front and back um, are not in tune with each other. And there is some part that might not be totally perfect on the front. So when you are playing a specific note, Usually on Mongolian instrument, it's like a mi bemol or re, it's around there. It's kind of like getting into a, a weird resonance frequency on the, for, the, for the box, from the box perspective. So it's kind of like um, this frequency cannot be very stable because how the wood was made, it's kind of like you're just on the tip of your feet. You're not stable like uh, strong so that's um, a mistake of the, the craftsmanship uh, it's not really possible to fix it once it, it, it was uh, built like that um, so that's a little bit of a problem uh, uh, maybe one thing that you can do it's kind of to change the position of the sound post so actually the, the wolf knot would, would become between uh, two concrete knots. So it would not be like, for example, a re or a mi bemol that would be between. So that would be a note that you would not play. Um, so by moving a little bit the sound post, you might be able to tweak a little bit this wolf knot problem. Um, but that's not really... Uh, a pure solution because if you change the tuning of the instrument, the wolf knot might get back 
on, uh, for example, a Ray or a Mi bemol or something. So from the physical point of view, there it's very complicated to fix it. Now, from the playing perspective, from the playing point of view, what you can actually do is uh, once you know your instrument and you know, okay, I know that when I will play this note, it's going to get crazy and I will have this wolf note. What you can do is kind of to force the finger a little bit more on the string. So the left hand, if you, if you are, if your bow hand is the right hand, you can kind of like push a little bit more than usual on the string and also give a little bit of accent or a little bit of um, kind of like more pressure on the bow. So kind of adjusting the pressure so um, it would absorb this kind of like weird vibration. Um, that's a way that most people kind of manage uh, to, to get rid of this wolf knot. So it, it requires a little bit of time and also to know your instrument well, to know that uh, when you are eating this specific knot, there is half, maybe 50% chance that the wolf knot get, will get out. So when you know it's going to be at that place, you can kind of like adjust your playing a little bit. So this knot will not like resonate uh, weirdly. So that's kind of it for the wolf knot. There is not that much magic. Of course, the best is to get an instrument from the beginning that doesn't have this flaw that was made correctly, that there were not like this uh, kind of like mistake in the craftsmanship. So usually when we try an instrument or actually when I try an instrument to, to send it abroad or to sell it, I usually play all these notes. So the chromatic scale, so not just do, re, mi, fa, sol, but do, do, dies, re, mi, bemol, mi, e, and everything. So I'm sure that there is no wolf knot. I also usually change the tuning a little bit to see. Um, but now uh, the, the, the factory where I buy the instrument to send it to you when you buy from me, uh, usually now they're kind of, um, it's very rare that there is this flaw because now they, it's been a while uh, that they are making instrument. They know there is these issues and now they kind of find out uh, how to fix it and all that. So now the wolf knot are pretty rare, usually with Ekshiglen, with this factory. Uh, with other maker, it still happened, uh, especially maybe Pegasus, you know, uh, the at least the, the instrument I tried from them uh, maybe a year or two years ago, there were kind of like this little issue. Maybe it's fixed now. I'm I'm not sure exactly, but usually now this problem kind of start to get solved. And the second part of uh, the question was, are the Inner Mongolian uh, motherboard tuned the same as the Mongolian one? And actually they are not, they are tuned higher. So when we have a fast CB mod on uh, Mongolian standard tuning for Inner Mongolian, that's uh, Sol Do, but it's one tone higher. So it kind of relates, of course, with the Chinese music influence, as the Chinese music kind of tend to have a very high pitch, especially when we when we play the Erhu or Hochir, depending on how you want to call it, like the, the little uh, little box instrument with very thin neck. It's it's very small, so it's very kind of like that. Um, I'm not really doing the Erhu very good, uh, sorry. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's tuned higher. Also, the box is made differently. The box tend to be a little bit thinner uh, from every aspect. It's a little bit longer in, in eight and the depth and width are a little bit uh, smaller. So it's also gonna give a, a little bit more mute sound and a pitch that is higher. So it's more like, Actually, in our Mongolian, they use the harmonic a lot. Uh, when in Mongolia, we, we say we play the tatlach. I will explain that in the next uh, video, in the next episode. In, in, in our Mongolia or Southern Mongolia, they play what we call boilo. And it's really using the harmonic a lot. So they have like this very high pitch, uh, more or less like constantly. That's very, that's also a very, very interesting uh, playing style. 
Um, so, so yeah, they, they tend to have more high pitch, more high note, and also to play more like a solo, pa, solo piece, uh, not like Mongolian who, who tend to play traditionally a lot of double string. Uh, in a Mongolia, Southern, Southern Mongolians, they kind of tend to play a little bit more of a uh, solo style. Uh, if you know Chi Burak, I, to I talked about him uh, in the last live. If you, if you saw, maybe watched and listened to him, his music is incredible. And this solo kind of like feel is very amazing. So that's kind of like a different of play style uh, between Mongolians and Southern, Southern Inner Mongolians. So I hope that answers the, the questions uh, of Bjorn. So I can uh, move on to the next one, which is also quite interesting, but the answer might be a little bit uh, quick. So the next question is from Tribal, also from Discord. So what does the musical institutes look looks like uh, in Mongolia? What opportunities are there for someone like me who may potentially want to study a semester of music school uh, in Mongolia. So the answer gonna be very, very simple and very sharp and quick. Uh, maybe some people might not like it, but basically if you have money, it's gonna be very, very, very easy. Um, when I, I will talk about my own experience, I try to get in uh, some of the big music school here and my wish, my love for the culture and so on didn't matter at all. The question was like, do you have $5,000? Uh, and that was kind of it. So if I would have it, I would be in that school. If not, then that's what happened. I didn't have it, so I went in other school. So basically, if you have the money, that's gonna be very, very simple. You just knock the door, you kind of pay, and it's gonna be it. Most of my experience kind of like that. Um, you, you might be lucky to find maybe another opportunity in maybe more secret or humble uh, little studio or school or something. But basically, it's very, very money related for foreigner. Uh, so it's kind of like a little bit frustrating. And also, but the Musical Institute, again, from what I saw, uh, it's European Europeanized, Russianized a lot. I mean, uh, I, I, I didn't really see any Mongolian traditional music teacher in any of, of those schools. Uh, most of the teaching is with score. It's like European pieces. It's modern uh, composition. It's like orchestral stuff for like 80 to 90 percent of uh, like the 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 the, the class or the lessons from what I saw. Uh, I know that there is some teacher that are more traditional, but they still need to teach kind of like the classical version. Uh, also because um, I talked uh, actually with Rambolt, M. Rambolt, which is a teacher in the Conservatory of Music in, in Mongolia, in Ultambatar. He actually is very good with all the traditional tatlak, the bilge and all that. But actually the students, um, they don't have, from what he told me, uh, they don't have this like kind of like inspiration or, or freedom, you know, this kind of improvisation feeling. They, they, most of the students, they always want to have something to read, to have the score, to have the, the partition to follow. Um, but the Mo Mongolian, the traditional Mongolian music is not like that. It's very freestyle. It's, it, there is a lot of improvisation. So most of the, the, the musical institute, actually, from what I saw, uh, the, the teaching way is very European. It's very Russian. Uh, there is a lot of score. It's a lot of um, kind of like bow practice. It's it just like a cello or violin uh, school, kind of, except that instead of playing a, a cello or a violin, they play merur. But to really find something that is really traditional, it's not going to be in musical institute. Uh, it's going to be either uh, from very old archive uh, videos or recording or stuff like that, 
or to go in the countryside with people that are not music teacher usually they're just mongolian nomads uh herder or or sometimes they do totally other job um i met a guy in donrav he's a I would say like a, a landscape nature uh, guard or something like that. And actually he knows a little bit of murder horse. So he, t- he showed me a few melodies, uh, a few things. So of course it's not like perfect, like a professional uh, cellist, but the idea, the melody, the, the feeling and everything all is there. So um, there is really two world uh, in my opinion, when it comes to the music here in Mongolia, there is this big, uh, maybe 70, 80, maybe 90%, I don't know, of this European, Russian way, uh, orchestral, modern, and all that. And the real Mongolian uh, traditional music, which is a little bit hidden, um, either in the countryside or sometimes just because it, it's not like, um, I would say, it, it doesn't go in the, in the way, in the program made uh, by all these big, cultural school. So it's the same for the Urtindo. Uh, the Urtindo is, is taught now in a very, very uh, opera way. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, there is really like two different words. So for tribal, to, to finish kind of to answer that question, um, in my opinion, first you need to be clear with what of the two words you want to learn. Uh, do you want to learn the real traditional Mongolian version or do you want something that is more Europeanized, Russianized, more like an orchestral modern way? So if you're more into the modern playing, so wooden metal, more like kind of like violin cello, then all the institutes that are in UB or even maybe in, in some cities in the countryside, that's going to be very uh, suitable for you. Uh, and if you have the money, that's going to be very easy to just come for a few months or, few, or for a semester or even for a year. Um, but if you are looking for something that is closer to the original music of Mongolians, uh, something that is closer to the traditions, then you don't need any school. You just take a pack, you take your instrument, you go in the countryside and you try to meet uh, people that can play. So... Um, and for that, it's just like kind of going in the in the countryside and ask around uh, first yurt or gear that you meet, you get in and you start to talk with the person. And OK, do you know someone that might know a bit of long song or a bit of Urtindo and uh, a bit of Maruhur? Where is that person? And then maybe the person going to say, ah, yeah, if you go there 100 kilometer, there is one guy and then following the way, talk with the person and, and so on. This is the real Mongolian. Uh, in school, it's, it's going to be very, 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 very modern. And even the thing from, again, from what I saw, uh, the things that are taught kind of traditional in school, they, they, they are not really singing. They are, they are not really sounding uh, traditional. They're, they're really, really uh, European influenced uh, from what I saw. So I hope that answers the question. I, I still try to be very objective about the subject, even though I really prefer and love the tradition more than the European modern uh, version. Um, hello, Zachongo. Hello, um, Bodbilek. And hello, Temulen. So thanks for joining us. So I hope that answers that question about the difference uh, about the musical institutes and about the difference between kind of like the modern Maruhur and the traditional um, Maruhur. And uh, yep, now I have actually, I see that Zachongo just came and the next question is from him. So also it's from uh, Discord. And it's actually a quite interesting question. Are there, oh sorry, are there many teachers of Komi and Maruhur in Mongolia? Are they common and easy to find or not? And how many people in Mongolia do you think knows how to play Maruhur or do Komi? So that, that's kind of gonna connect with the previous question actually. So, um, for the homie teacher and murderer teacher, that's going to be, of course, super easy 
to find. But again, um, it's going to depend which kind of teacher you, you want to find. Uh, again, for the Homi, the Urtindo, the Murder basically almost every mus musical art and dance in Mongolia, now there is kind of a separation between the traditional way and the modern way. Uh, so it's kind of like the natural way on one side, the traditional natural way. And on the other side, it's kind of like the professional for stage performance uh, way. So if you are looking again for something that is more modern, more like stage performance oriented, it's going to be super easy. I mean, you just come in UB and you, you ask maybe to uh, a few people, a few person, and then you're going to find a teacher, I think, in a matter of minute. Um, when it comes for the natural, traditional way, if you're looking for a teacher, again, that's going to be the same. You need to go in the countryside, uh, mostly, because in the city, uh, these people are very rare, uh, very hard to find. So that's that's like uh, the the big uh, maybe if you saw the the episode into the Maruhur about how the Maruhur became uh, with the wooden front, you might have an idea of the big Russian influence that happened uh, during the last century. Um, so that's kind of why there is now a separation uh, in my. It, opinion in my vision between the two were between the traditional and between the modern and for the homie that's the same now they, there is a, a, a like the natural homie is much more peaceful when um, the stage homie is kind of like pushing the skill of the homie to 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 maybe a, a, a limit that is maybe too high I don't know um, from what I hear, from what I feel, I really f see this big difference between like people in the countryside singing homie very peacefully um, with their heart, you know, kind of expressing a lot of things. And on the other hand, uh, hearing or seeing kind of like stage performance that with the person becoming totally red. Uh, almost, almost exploding and and super strong, super. I don't know. For me, I, it's it, it feels a little bit weird uh, to me. That's of course an evolution of uh, singing art. Um, but yes, yeah, like again, depend on what you're looking for: traditional or stage modern. So, so that's for the the first part. Uh, so are they easy to find or not? Yes, of course. Uh, modern is easy to find. Traditional is a little bit more rare. And the last part was like, how many people in Mongolia do you think know how to play Murugor or do Homi? Um, I, I don't know how I could uh, put a number of, on these questions. I would say that maybe... Mm, if I take the, the professional, the, the people that went to school out of the equation, I just take the random uh, person in the street or in the countryside, I would say that eventually most people can kind of sing a little bit of Urtindo. Um, that's a little bit out of the question. But if we go in the West, of course, almost every person I met can sing a little bit of Homi, of course, with different level of performance. Um, some are very basic, some are quite good, uh, some are super impressive. Um, for the Maruhur, it's a little bit more rare. Uh, I remember when I went to Tess, so it's in Ofs in the West, um, I almost didn't meet any person that would be able to play the Maruhur. But some people were able to sing Homi. Um, even if it, if it was very basic, uh, they had kind of like the feel for it, you know, for the Maruhur, that's a little bit more rare. So I would say that in the West, most people, from what I could see, can sing a little bit of Homi, uh, even if it's very basic. And in the East, almost every Mongolian can say, uh, can sing Long Song. Uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy how they know every song, every word. It's like so amazing. Each time I go in a, in a festivity and it starts it start to sing, everyone is following, everyone knows every song. It's like a, 
it's like a jukebox karaoke live it's super impressive super amazing and the murder world it's a little bit more rare so um, that's why um, even if someone cannot really play the murder world that well just learning or something mongolians they're always very happy to hear uh, because the player nowadays can be a little bit rare um, especially in the countryside uh, because also a lot of metal player that were in the countryside kind of came in the city um, to perform or to teach in some school or something like that. So in the countryside, that's a little bit more rare. And also for a more practical reason, uh, to play murder road, we need the murder road. So with all the nomadization and all that, sometimes the instrument just break. So they, they just end up without any instrument or with an instrument that is a little bit broken, that cannot be played or anything. So I would say that homage and long song singer are, are quite uh, common in a way uh, in the countryside, in the city, that's a little bit more rare. And murderer player are definitely a bit rare to find. Uh, even in the city, it's it's. If I again, if I take out all the professional and the student, the music students out of the equation, just the normal people, uh, that that can be a little bit rare. But every people have this kind of like feeling affinity with it and want to actually learn at least one uh, song or something. Um, for me, that's a little bit weird because that would be like learning one word in one language. So I want to learn Japanese. Okay, uh, itadakemas, and that's it. So I'm not sure that's something that can work like that. Uh, to play the murder world, we it's not just we cannot just learn one song. It's like a whole philosophy, a whole feeling, a whole story. So so yeah, I I, I think that's like that would be my answer uh, to that. So I I hope that it answers uh, your your question, Zachongo. So that's kind of it for the. Discord uh, question. I don't know if in the chat there is some people that asked some things. Uh, I listened to some of Chibutak's music. It is really beautiful. It also does sound like it's playing. It's played in a higher uh, tune. Yeah, indeed it is. Uh, it's uh, it's Chibutak is, in my opinion, one of the best, if not the best, murder watch out there it's he's still alive he's still playing so good it's like he's a li living legend i mean it's uh he's very inspir inspiring um he's playing is is so deep uh he put all his inside feeling and everything on the table if i could say uh when he plays so he chibu like is amazing and he's super he's just a super guy he's so gentle he's super fine Super, super funny, and and I mean, I I I had the occasion to meet him and to have some uh, WeChat conversation with him because I met some Inner Mongolian, Southern Mongolian uh, people um, in in the city, and that was just the guy is like uh, the Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley of the Maroon. He is so simple, so humble. It's it's just crazy. So I was very amazed. I was super intimidated. Uh, to meet him and to see him, to talk, uh, to have conversation. I was super shy because the guy is so huge. And he he just made me comfortable after a few seconds because it was like, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, he was eating his soup. So he was preparing for a concert and stuff. So, so he's really amazing. So that's a uh, little, little parenthesis, if I could say, about uh, Chibo, like. And now to, to finish, I would like to present you uh, something. Actually, someone asked in the last live um, how to learn the Mongol script and how to learn uh, the Mongolian calligraphy. So I'm actually, I, I went in the countryside with a group of calligraphers maybe like a few weeks ago. Maybe you saw some picture on my Instagram. And I actually kind of met one woman that is a calligrapher, of course, and she just created, just released a book to learn the Mongol script and to learn the Mongolian calligraphy. So I will present that book 
uh, to you now. And I'm trying, I should, I will try to meet her in the next few days because I would, because I would like to make some kind of partnership. Um, so eventually bring her uh, on Skype or, or WhatsApp or whatever student from abroad um, through the whole kind of like community, uh, send, send her some people to learn the script. And they also have kind of like a reduced price uh, for the book to send uh, to you so you can learn. So I will present you her book. So I'm, I'm very lucky I have a signed version. So that's her writing. Her name is uh, Altantuya Batodlak. So you can see that her writing is like super, super cool. Um, so I'm very happy that I have my signed version of this book. So I'm, I'm not going to write anything on this version. <laughs> so it's called Oyun Turkur. Um, and inside, so it's all in, uh, in Mongolian, in Cyrillic. Uh, but I, I would like to maybe try with her to convert this book uh, in English so it could touch more people abroad. I'm also actually starting and working on a book in that idea to kind of try to help foreigners learn the Mongolian script. So hopefully this is going to work and I'm, I'm going to be able to partner and maybe work together, collaborate with her. So that, that would be very great. Um, so I will just show you a bit of what is inside the book. Um, so basically, there is all the, the different characters. So you can you can see. So this is written um, with the computer writing. There is some example of calligraphy. So for example, that's one of her creation, one of her painting calligraphies. And then there is. Uh, so this is her writing. And then you need to write back here. The same, uh, the same text. So there is one part for the Mongolian script and below you should, so it's for Mongolian, below you should write the, the conversion in Cyrillic. So she did a really, really good job. I mean, that's like, the book is like so awesome. So you see there is a lot of, uh, of her calligraphies in the book. And also there is like some, uh, how to say, grammar, grammar rules in it. So you can also, I, I'm not sure, I, to be honest, I didn't go through all the book yet. Um, but you have kind of like the essential, if not almost every rules uh, to know the Mongol script in this book. So, um, I mean, it's, it's super cool. There is a lot of calligraphy. So yeah, I, I, will, I will turn a bit. So a little text, you write in Mongol script, you make the conversion in Cyrillic, and then here you have some grammar uh, part and, and so on, some calligraphy example. So it gives you an idea of what uh, the, the different, uh, I would say the different piece should uh, look like. So for example, here it's written head, so it means loves, so she write the word and she put like two hearts to also express the idea behind the word. So that that's I I mean I mod script is so awesome, you know. So another one here and I and when I talked with her, I think like uh, yesterday or, or two days ago, she said that some of the calligraphies are for sale. So if even you are interested, maybe you can buy it. So I will try to to put the book on my shop. Um, and if she's okay, maybe I will try to put some of her calligraphies on the shop as well. So if you're interested, you will be able to buy uh, from my website. So I will, as usual, as most of you know, I'm not going to make uh, any, uh, I would say like, a, uh, well, I, I'm not, I don't even know the word. <laughs> I'm not going to make money on her back because it's her uh, piece. So, or maybe just a little bit, maybe one or two dollar uh, for my work to, to go to the post and, and manage everything. So I'm, I'm checking if there is another uh, thing that might be worth showing where, but most of it, it's like every page are kind of like 
you have the text on one side, you, you make the writing, you copy it, you try to write it back with some grammary and all that. So that that's a very, very nice book. So the idea, I think I, I'm uh, the, the book, I will, I need to talk with her about the price and everything. And if she's, and if she agrees to be part kind of of the Oro, maybe collaborate to make an English version with me, uh, because I also have some little addition. Uh, I, I've started to kind of write the legend between each of the characters made research to kind of write the legend uh, be behind each of the letter of the characters because each characters have a little story. So that's something that I want people to, to be able to know and to understand. So if it goes well, this book might be in my shop very soon, uh, maybe in the next few days, if she's agree. Um, and the idea of the price, including shipping, I think it's going to be between 15 to 20 euro. Uh, so again, I need to talk with her about the price and all that. So definitely, if you are interested into uh, learning the Mongol script, the Mongolian calligraphy, uh, and you need a physical support, you can buy this book. This is definitely super interesting. Even if you don't, um, even if you don't know Mongolian, it's still gonna help you learn and see the different character, how it is. And if you need help, you can always, uh, after buying the book, get on Discord. If I can, I will try to make Altantuya come on Discord so she can also contribute directly on Discord. And you can just ask your question and all that. So uh, for the price, like 15 or 20 euro, that's super, super, super good deal if you're interested in this beautiful Mongol script. So I wanted to, to talk about that because that's for me also very precious. This writing is very important and especially with the current political uh, things that are going on. So yeah, that, that's really a, a good book. And Altantuya also is a super good person, super gentle, super friendly. So, so that's also a way for me to somehow um, support, if I can try to sell a bit of her book abroad on one side for me, that's good because I'm helping spreading the culture. And on the other side, I also help her keep going and support what she's doing, the categories and spreading the culture also here in Mongolia. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of like the little surprise uh, that I had for this episode. So let's see in the chat if there is some other questions. Oh, there is someone actually. Um, but Bilek Baddorch is asking, are there workshops that offer medieval crafting lessons? I will be visiting next summer and was interested in crafting my own instrument. <clears throat> so, well, I guess um, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I guess that if you go in, in, in maybe any workshop or with any maker, you might have the opportunity to make your own instrument in collaboration with the person or in the factory. Um, maybe, of course, paying a little of money as usual. Mm, I, I don't think that my, I think that that should be pretty easy to do. Uh, you might need to, um, to talk with few people though, uh, because of course, depending on each person's schedule and all that, but I'm pretty sure that 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 can be that can be found out and can be done. So if you're interested, like, uh, sorry, what it was like, uh, but but like bad Dutch. If you're interested, you can get in touch with me. We can talk about it. Uh, see when you will come, what kind of instrument you want to do, and once you are. Uh, kind of set up on what you want when you would come. I can also help you connect with some uh, factory, with some makers, uh, and then you can manage directly with them. Uh, I, I see by your name, I guess you are Mongolian, so I guess you can speak Mongolian. So that, that should be very easy for you to just talk directly uh, with the person. So if you want, I can help you get connected with, uh, I, I know, I think uh, a little dozen, uh, maybe a dozen of, of people that makes Murur. 
So that should be quite easy to find someone that would be okay and happy to have you help out and make your own instrument and all that. As I made my own instrument, I can tell you that it's super, 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 super awesome uh, to spend the time crafting, building the instrument, uh, see how it comes from just a piece of wood to a piece of art, to music. Uh, so if you like the instrument, even if you're not playing later, uh, that's a really, really amazing experience because it's also, it also requires a lot of patience. Uh, it's not just, um, it's, it's just not transforming in one second from wood to an instrument. There is a lot of things going on. And I think it's quite interesting to experience that and to create something, an instrument that would be yours uh, and definitely yours because with your sweat, with your blood, tears and love and all that. Um, so yeah, I would, I would definitely be happy to help you connect with some maker so you can, so you can make your own instrument. So let's see if there is something else. And I think that's it. And my dog is kind of waking up. <laughs> so, so I think that's it for today, for today's live. Uh, I hope that it was interesting, that you enjoyed. Um, also know that just yesterday I released a new episode of Into the Madurur dedicated to the long song Urtindo. I think that it's quite informative. Um, and there is a lot of essential information in it. So please, if you're interested in the Mongolian culture and music, take a look on it. And as usual, feel free to like, to share uh, the live, the video, if you feel that it was interesting. Subscribe to the channel, click the bell to get the notification for the live and for the new videos. And if you are interested um, into having conversation with the community, you can um, you can like uh, join the Discord. The link is in the description. And if you want to support what I do, because I really also need a lot of support, <laughs> um, you can see on my website there is a subscription option, donation option. It's kind of like a Patreon, but uh, I'm not on Patreon because they take a huge percentage. So you can do it on my website directly, eventually. Or buy an instrument from me. It's also helping me keep going, or help, uh, or buy some music or some piece of art that are on my shops. So if you want to contribute, there is a lot of option uh, for you to do so. And yeah, I think I think that that's kind of it. So thanks, Zachongo. Uh, I'm glad that you liked the the episode. Uh, I really tried my best. And thanks also Bjorn for joining and thanks everyone for joining, watching the live, enjoying and, and listening to this cultural sharing. Until next time, may the blessing of the eternal blue sky be upon you. Bye-bye.